good evening, everyone. My name is Joaquim Zaidan. I'm uh, one of the hosts at uh, Civil Line Community. I welcome you all to, to this talk. Uh, for those who have, haven't been on Civil Line before, just a small introduction. Uh, Silver Line Community is basically an online platform that aims to actively engage creative and cultural professionals in designing a sustainable ecosystem for the creative industry. And this is through uh, networking and knowledge sharing. So uh, in March, we started uh, off with a program with our existing members where we would invite a member with a specific specialization to host a specialized community. So we have around nine communities uh, within, the, within the platform. And one of those communities is focused on media and film. And this is where we've invited Nawaf uh, to be the host for it for the months of March and April. And within that hosting process, uh, uh, he got to choose a topic that he'd like to discuss, a, a guest that he'd like to host a conversation with, in addition to other stuff that he's been engaging the community with. So uh, with that, I leave the floor to Nawaf to gear this conversation with Hint. And any rules of engagement for the talk, I put them in the chat box. So please do follow those throughout the conversation. Nawaf, the mic is yours. Thank you, Akim. <clears throat> Welcome, everyone. Uh, good evening. Um, I will not waste a lot of time in uh, introduction, because uh, if you're here, then you know who is Hint and you know what she's doing. We will be picking her brains and uh, talking about some details uh, about her work. Uh, but before we start, um, I just have to tell you a quick note. I, I, I find the chat box very distracting, so I will not be looking at that. So please don't direct anything to me because I will not be looking at it. Uh, we will open the floor for a Q&A at the last quarter of the session, probably uh, 15, 20 minutes uh, after our conversation. So until then, if you want to turn on your cameras, please do so that we feel we are all together as if it's a real event. If not, feel free, it's fine. You will be muted anyway. Uh, enjoy. Hind, good evening. Hello. Hello. Hi. Hi, Abdullah. Hello. Is that oh, Abdullah just joined. <laughs> Abdullah, we started the conversation, so you need to be on mute. Yes. OK. <laughs> Yeah, it started to feel like a real, uh, <clears throat> like yeah, a real yeah, like we're all amazing. walking into a, a amazing, room. Amazing. Yeah, um, I know. Hi, and um, let's jump into it. Um, <laughs> but uh, we can jump before we talk about something very important uh, that is happening around the globe, which is the pandemic. And I just want to ask you a very simple question: How did you deal with a pandemic from a personal point of view? and the creative point of view or a cultural point of view, not to work, uh, but on those two levels. How, how did that affect you? I, I mean, on a personal level, it's just obviously, I mean, first thing is thinking things about safety, health, or family, and you know, who's around, who I'm thankful, like I'm, you know, in Dubai where, and with my family. But these are kind of the immediate thing. But then over time, you just start seeing, uh, you know, the inequality of how things are being handled, the inconsistencies and, and you know, and who's suffering and who isn't and, you know, and how, how can one help? And uh, especially, I think the first few months where a lot of people lost jobs and, and it was very upsetting to hear. And, you know, and you start hearing about people who are homeless in Dubai and people are sleeping on the streets and things like we've never, you know, had before. And then finding out there are no systems in place that can help these people because there's just no, you know, there's no place for homeless people to go and sleep in, you know, and, you know, and so the, the, there was a bit of helping out, you know, dropping food or donating money. So those first few months, those were key important things that I felt were important if one can, you know, take this responsibility because immediately, I think, especially in the arts and culture world, there was a very selfish response that was all about you know what do we do our places are closed and how do we handle and i felt like there are far more important things and at least over here the culture sector and the you know no there wasn't like people losing jobs because it's just you know but you're hearing about you know other places in other cities where you know i mean you know big layoffs everywhere so but just kind of the attitude of um, you know, and I think I wrote that piece about, you know, the culture bubble in Dubai, because it was all about these big institutions and it was not about artists, because suddenly you've got a whole bunch of individuals who've lost opportunities, who've lost jobs, and these could be artists, these could be musicians, you know, and, 
Um, and there was no discussion on how to help them. And it was only a few months later that suddenly, you know, there was these relief funds and, you know, things like that. But it was just weird to see. It took a while. I mean, and, it, you know, and something was done eventually to help out, but not as, you know, I, you know, I don't know. Hope it'll be something that'll be long term. So yeah. personally, it was, I think, uh, just seeing and feeling disappointed, but I just also thankful that I'm with family and, you know, we're okay. Creatively, I, it, I you know, I, that was like a mental freeze. There was no, you know, I mean, I was supposed to be preparing for a solo exhibition that was going to open in January 2021. I mean, it's been postponed. And that and 2020 was basically a year for me to focus on this because it was the first time I was going to have a solo exhibition and I wanted to spend time kind of going through my personal archive. And I just really... I just I struggled to do that. It was very hard to to do that. And and I think one of the one of the you know few consistent things in my life is cinema, like just going <laughs> to the cinema. And uh, and they closed here for 12 weeks, which again, Dubai is one of the few places that you know it only closed for 12 weeks and they've been opened ever since. And I've been going and spending a lot of time in cinema. You know, I'm the type who I'm happy to watch anything and everything. And that has kept me that, the, like I said, that one, one of the few consistent things in my entire life and that's still there. So I was happy. I can still go. I can still sit in the cinema and watch it. Most of the time, it's just me. And that's fine. I've, you know, I always like that even before pandemic, just going, you know, in the afternoon and because I just don't want to sit with other people. <laughs> so that, that, so that has helped just kind of, you know, emotionally and just being engaged with cinemas. And we, you know, we've had a, you know, decent run of films, you know, new films from, uh, you know, the States, other parts of the world. So it's been interesting also just seeing how cinemas were coping with it. And I think walking became an, uh, a regular activity, which I didn't do before. And suddenly I was, uh, you know, rediscovering places in Dubai that I hadn't been engaged in. And because before pandemic, I would, I would travel frequently. So now this has been the longest since I've not traveled. And uh, with that, it's uh, just, it's made me confront and think about my relationship with Dubai. And that includes, you know, creatively, personally, you know, so... So there's just been a lot of thinking. There's been a lot of walking. There's been a lot of taking photos. So I've been just taking photos a lot, and I'm hoping some of these photos will make its way to the um, to the exhibition I'm working on. Okay, great, great. So let's uh, divert a little bit to something else, and uh, I want to talk about the media sector, uh, specifically in the UAE and generally in the Arab world. Um, how do you view it, like? Briefly, in general, do you think we are in a good place, bad place? Um, what are negatives, positives that, that sometimes you notice? <laughs> Look, I mean, it, I mean, it's. I don't think we're in a good place. I think just media and journalism in general is not in a good place around the world. Like you know, so it's already an issue. But I think here it was. Ne it never had a good. It was never in a strong good place ever, right? So, so I mean, you know, I think first thing is you know there is no independent media. So that's I think. The first thing so we don't have independent media um but what i've just felt maybe around 10 years ago you know new publications you had international publications coming and setting up and you know some even more recently so you think okay you know these international publications will increase the quality and there'll be better you know writing and coverage or whatever but over time and especially maybe the last five years or so i just feel everything is just a pr exercise there's no investigative writing <laughs> there's no we we completely lack culture writing so we don't have you know culture journalism everything's a pr even film reviews they just end up feeling very pr driven it's just about promotion everything's great um there's no uh, there's just a lack of kind of even diverse voices uh and even finding now writers from within right it's always this reliance on writers from abroad and and you know and that's always been the case, but and there's never a knowledge transfer, and people come and go, and then the you know the ones who are here, we're seeing this parade of you know people coming and going, seeing the caliber of uh, media in general, uh, and media in this case, I, I I think it's more about kind of like you know journalism and and writing. I'm not talking about the advertising sector or anything. You know that's like a whole separate topic, but it's just yeah, how does media support and reinforce? Uh, things happening here and again I speak maybe you know more from a culture uh, uh, side of things and it's just very lacking you know and 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 maybe one of the reasons the, I started my blog is just okay it's an independent voice to just at least tell people about things 
happening that don't get covered because it's not big sponsored events. Because before that, I was, you know, in this habit of always emailing people and friends, okay, hey, this is happening, this is happening this month. And, and then that evolved into a blog, which, you know, it's now 10 plus years. Uh, but, but since then, I think also maybe the last five, eight years, social media, like everything's very fragmented, everything's very short term. It's just all about what looks good on Instagram and just there's no attention even to reading anything, right? So, and I laugh when I see certain accounts on Instagram and they describe it as a blog and it's just really selfies and pictures of them. And I'm like, why are you calling your account a blog? Like that's, you know, so it's it's just, it, it, so that shift of kind of mentality of what they see. And I know I probably sound extremely old fashioned. Like I think even saying blog already sounds really, really old fashioned. And then when we tried to, you know, do something different, it was the podcast. So we thought, okay, let's, let's, you know, podcast now seems to be a thing. And so that's something I, I started with Wael, who's one of the att attendees here. And it was again about having kind of these culture related discussions, which we were finding lacking in, in the media, right? So there's no discussion, there's no, you know, deep, in, you know, kind of uh, thoughtful interviews with artists, there's no deeper discussions about opinions or thinking about work. Everything, like I said, is just, uh, everything's based on a press release. Anything that you see is already based on an existing press release. And, uh, and we wanted to do something different. And uh, yeah, so that was, that's it. But you know, it can't just be down to one or two people to do this all the time. And, and sometimes I think fine, did this, is it because I didn't professionalize my blog? That's why it's not like, oh, a, a big established name. But I was doing that while I mean, I started it whilst I was working a full time job. I, you know, I was doing it as a way to kind of balance my, you know, mind and, and, and you know, kind of in, in the in the corporate world. So the blog was my outlet and then eventually I stopped working and then I'm you know pursuing myself as an artist I'm also pursuing travel like that's like a big important part of something I, I you know that was you know I've been doing before pandemic obviously and then and then yeah and over time I think also kind of doing new things which I've never had an opportunity to do before things like you know film programming or film curation and, you know, these, these are things that, you know, we, there's no opportunities to learn them, to study them, you know, as, as careers. I mean, even, even if I did want to pursue anything like that, I would, you know, I wanted to be a photographer and, you know, and, and, and parents would go away, what is that? That's not, a, that's not a proper job, you know? So it's these kind of typical things that at least in my generation, you, you know, you go through and it's only now, you know, when I, you know, started to work that I can now pay and get my own camera and get my own film and, and do things on my own time because there was no opportunities to go and, and, and learn, right? So everything is very much self-taught and you pick over time and, and, you know, and you grow. But what I see is there's no growth or no development, you know, on, on, on kind of the media side of things. So the same complaints we have now is very much, it could be similar to five years ago, 10 years ago you know, 20 years ago. And the me, I mean, even the radio, right? So the radio also is very bland. Uh, the few times we've had opportunities to go on the radio to talk about things with well, and over time it felt like the commercial break would be, you know, would take over, interrupt our discussions and, and more times allocated for the commercial break because, you know, the show is brought to you by brand X, Y, Z. And, you know, you're supposed to go there and try to have a talk about culture and suddenly you're rushed into talking about it, you know? So, which is why I guess we started the podcast. So, yeah, so from a radio level, from a television level, from a newspaper level, it's very much a show. It's very much uh, PR and more... Uh, more so lately it's just everything that feels very if it's instagrammable i mean it's come to an extent where even in newspapers the the, the, the article will be mostly embedded instagram posts right so so it's not even like taking the time to write something they're just you know saying oh this is what happened and the, you know and the whole article is embedded you know images of the twitter feed or instagram post uh that 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 makes me think about uh yani how do you view the importance of media in shaping uh, our aesthetic taste as an as individuals, the cultural environment, uh, how we view arts uh, in general. Does does the media play their role in this? Besides maybe education, it's part of it. It's part of the ecosystem, right? So, Yanni, anything that happens in the culture, it's not the event, it's not the individual, right? So, it's also it's also about writing. It matters, like what what happens over time. Like now, we know about things because things have been written about. You know, there's history, there's legacy. What's being covered now that, you know, maybe 10, 20 years from now, someone wants to research what happened here, 
in this part of the world uh, culturally, what information, like I've, I've had to, like quite a few PhD uh, students, you know, who come over to research and, you know, they, they, there's no easily um, archived information to, you know, access to. And, and, and I don't want to say we have to be like the New York Times or, you know, but, but like these are established institutions and it's not about developing taste, but it's, it's developing, it's, I think maybe finding a, a thor voices of authority that you know whether they're they, okay they could be tastemakers they could be not but it's you know having people with the right skill set to write about things right now the reliance is on influencers I hate that word but and and even influencers now are being given column space and I'm like they, they these people don't know how to put a sentence together you know clearly you see it on, on the way they speak or on their Instagram posts but it's just because they've got a following so it's just unfortunate this has um, lately it's just this reliance on uh, you know if you have a big following then you know institutions want to work with you but the role of media is there to report is to document is to comment on um, and and there's value in that because like I said you know over time how do you know about you know just as an art exhibition you know there's a catalog there'll be books written and it's all there because it's all part of the history building the legacy building and here it's very minimal you know and and yani, I mean, at least we, the likes of Gulf News and Al Bayan, have, you know, they've been around for 40 plus years. And when you look at the older stuff, there, there's rich material, you know, despite it's still not being top of the league, you know, <laughs> media, but there's rich material, which tells you a story about a place, which gives you insight about what's happening, whether it's a listing of events or, a list, you know what I mean? Like in a, that information is available. Now that it, it, the equivalent of today's, uh, publications there isn't that so you, you don't know what's happening there's no record of it uh, a lot of organizations don't maintain their websites or they don't archive even you know past events um you know it comes and goes and uh, and then i think so sometimes you know my blog will be my reminder you know i have or even my twitter feed like i've been active on twitter for you know 10 plus years I actually refer if I, I, you know, there'll be a lot of things I'll just put in a, a you know, a venue or place and I'll, I'll look it up and, oh, okay, I talked about it because I went to it properly and then it reminds me. But um, yeah, because like I said, if even just going through older issues, you know, from the 80s or 90s of magazines and publications, it, it tells you a history of a place, right? So, you know, like the social history, uh, culture history, and the equivalent of that today is is very lacking well that's uh, that's a great response uh, with you yani creating the culturalist uh, to whatever you found lacking in the media uh, because from my point of view the culturist is like a small uh, a solo uh, uh, magazine um, and that makes me wonder because it covers a lot of things it's not just films not just arts yani sometimes even on your social media accounts you you you're always uh, 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 highlighting uh, um, issues and problems in the society and the and the and the and the workflow in general. Yani, you are obsessed with making our country better uh, with whatever it takes, and that makes me ask two questions: um, How do you view the culturist in the long run? Yani, obviously, it's been more than ten years now. Uh, is it going to remain a small blog, personal blog? with one person running it? Are you thinking maybe of hiring someone, making it a little bit bigger? Um, and how do you, how, how do you think, wh why critique, critique in general, uh, is always viewed negatively in our society? Yeah. The, the ideas, I mean, in the whole Arab world, I think it's- Yeah, a, yeah, yeah. A yeah. Issue. I, I think with the blog, like, uh, you know, I, I there was, um, an exhibition about publication uh, a couple of years ago, Warehouse 421. And it gave me the opportunity to think about an idea that I had was, you know, okay, do I, you know, make a print version of the blog, right? And I, so I started playing with that and I just created a dummy book to see what that is. And, you know, taking only just certain art, you know, pieces, not obviously everything. And uh, I, part of it was, it, it caused anxiety because it means reading your older stuff and then like, oh my God, and you know, and you know, maybe the writing, I, the kind of writing I did, <laughs> it's not how I would write it today. So there was a self anxiety thing. 
I'm still determined to maintain it. I mean, it's not as active. Like I don't write as much as I used to when I first started because there was that hunger for output for me to put stuff. And then it kind of slowed down and life also gets in the way and whatever. But now I try to, you know, obviously post things. I've been thinking a lot of about maybe using it more as personal essays. So I have all these, I, you know, thoughts in my head and what do I do you know should it become that um I, I I it's not necessarily something that I want it to be bigger than it is it's there every uh, 9 December I celebrate its anniversary you know I say it's you know it's been 10 years I kind of like you know it, it it exists it's there um and I think it's almost um uh, it's a statement to say that it's it it's still there right that I'm still updating it and it's a you know just because Again, and we've talked about this, you know, just things come and go, nothing stays, even if, you know, some, we think so, I mean, and if something goes on more than 10 years, it's already a big milestone in the UAE, right? So when, when DIFF celebrated 10 years and then 11 years, I'm like, oh my God, but then 14th year, it stopped, right? <laughs> so it, it's almost like, no, I'm adamant that I want to keep this blog, even if it's one post a month or whatever, you know, which, you know, I think I'm trying not, you know, some days it's it, some months it is that and other times it's not but it it's there and i use it like it's also you know um it helps me because i can then also go to film festivals as media and you know my you know my publication is the blog right so so it's also it, it kind of it's helped me being able to do things that I wouldn't be able to do because I'm not, if I go to film festivals as media, then if I don't have a, an actual publication or editor that I'm writing for, yeah. you know, it, it'll be hard to get a media pass, for example. But yeah, there is, you know, so I write up about these festivals. I use it as my little, I've been using it as a photo diary as well. So this monthly exercise of taking pictures and that's an output. Like I'm not even putting it on my artist website. I'm putting it on the blog because I'm sharing it as a photo diary, uh, and also listing again because there are still things that don't get promoted or you know people know about. So uh, again, I'm insistent on using the blog to highlight these things. I mean, definitely readership has gone down because again, the early years of the blog, yeah, people were actively reading, people were actively sharing, but again this shift of uh, social media, like where everything, you know, it's only a post where, you know, it takes away uh, and it's deliberate because obviously these social media companies want you to spend time only on their website, right? And, and I'm resistant to that because no, then, it, you know, they, they shouldn't control your information, your content, your writing, like, you know, the blog should still exist. Because I could easily have, yeah, shifted the culture to just now Instagram posts and Facebook uh, updates and, you know, without having to write anything. But it's a deliberate and important tactic that no, the blog dot the cultures dot com is still existing, you know. So, um, so I know it's not it's not yeah definitely readership has gone down. I mean, if anything, I've always had readership more from abroad than the UAE anyway. <laughs> so that I think already says something. Uh, but it's um, I think I still want to maintain it, and. And the, word, the, the critique and why this fear of critique, I always wish there was another word. I mean, we've had this conversation, I've had this conversation with where, like, you know, what if we said we're analyzing an event or analyzing, you know, uh, a, a movie, maybe then people wouldn't freak out. But because even in Arabic, right, not the so it already has this, you know, you're someone, you're, you're crit criticizing someone, you know, and and, it's and that's why word. it's not a bad Sorry? word it's, it's not it's, a bad word it's not People but it's, associated it's, with a negative uh, feeling but yeah. uh, it's not true it's, it shouldn't be it's My, like it you shouldn't said, it's, yeah uh, but I, I think case, it's, it's uh, analyzing uh, good and bad. I think it projects how people feel, you know, their insecurities, I think, you know, like, and a lot of, you know, we all have our own, you know, insecurities. And, uh, but then if the idea is to put something out there, you know, a creative piece of work, whether it's an art piece or a film or music, it's out there and it the whole, and why is it out there? Because you want to engage it with, engage with people. You want people to engage with it. Um, but then when you talk about it, <laughs> people are very hesitant on how you talk about it, right? So you, you're only expected to say, oh, that was amazing. 
that was beautiful. <laughs> that really moved me. <laughs> but then if you want to say something deeper, how does this work engage with past work? How does it engage historically? How does it engage currently, uh, socially, culturally? And, and that's what the role of criticism is, right? So in all forms, that's what the, the objective and you know a good critique will do an amazing job of putting and connecting dots or or seeing things or bringing insights that maybe an average viewer or an average goer wouldn't notice so that's why i say like you know it needs for people who who know who have background where they can talk about these things and not just uh, you know again bringing you know just social media celebrities you know suddenly they're the ones who are now being given the platform to talk about something right so I mean we see it now with film premieres you know who, who are the key people invited It's the ones with the big following on social media to just come and take a picture and say I walked on the red carpet and all oh, this movie you know looked amazing on the big screen you know and, and that, that's as far as it goes you know hashtag name of the cinema hashtag name of the distributor uh, and then like, okay, wait, so the old fashioned way of like, okay, next day, what's in the paper? <laughs> you know, nothing, right? So same with opening, same with art events. I mean, even when I see like museums engaging with people who are big on social media, who never on their own will go and go to a museum, <laughs> you know, who never on their own will engage with art, but they're suddenly now, there's a video clip of them and they're talking about, you know, how beautiful it is. And it's, that's it, it's very superficial, it's very top level, because that, that seems to be enough for a lot of people. No one, um, it's, it's hard work to engage, to think about something, to present it, to make sense of it. But uh, over time, it's no one's interested. And they say it's everywhere is like that. But do we need to be like everywhere? You know, the whole point, aren't we also told, you know, nothing's impossible and we're the best, then let's let's show that as well, you know? So, uh, so yeah, it's, in, it's like, that's why it's constantly having to say, you know, critique or the word, you know, uh, a critic or criticism is not a bad word. It's not a negative word, but it, it, it enrich the work and make people think about it differently to talk about it, you know, but um, yeah, I don't know what's the source of why it's, there's a negativity towards it. Um, and maybe I also sometimes think because we don't have independent media. So again, so there's always already, you know, you have to write something that feels is not gonna offend anyone or upset anyone or censored, you know, so that's already, like I said, the starting point has always been weak. You know, we've never really had a strong base to have journalism or media that could uh, do something more than just what it's doing now. No, I think I think uh, <clears throat> uh, accepting uh, criticism, whatever it is, uh, is a serious or actually not accepting criticism. It's a serious issue. And sometimes sometimes it goes even beyond analyzation. Sometimes just the mere fact that somebody didn't like expressing the, the, the fact that I didn't like your work, I didn't like your painting, I didn't like this photograph, I didn't like this film. It's my right. It's either like it or not like it. It's fine. <laughs> we, I mean, we, we're not even analyzing. I'm just saying, well, it didn't move me. And anyway, people get offended and they don't understand that different tastes are, are normal. This is, this is the human being. Um, but that brings a question. Is it, is, it, is it the role of the cultural institutions, the educational institutions, to, to, to have some impact instilling this concept in, in, in people? Regular people, we're not talking about you know, uh, professionals. We're talking about how a regular person could develop taste. Because that so person later can become a creator. Do we, do we, do we look at the younger ages? in terms of education? Uh, I mean, look, I used to think, yes, it's the responsibility of the institutions, but more and more I feel it, you know, I'm, I'm just disappointed that that's not happening. Uh, they can play a role, but again, if they also feel like they can be leaders in this instead of followers, right? Because again, everyone wants to do the same thing. It's, it's, and it's very rare to see uh, a cultural institution doing something differently. I don't want to name names who are good or bad because I just don't want to sound like I'm, you know, doing preference over the other. There are some who are trying to do or engage with the community. Could more be done, of course, but also others where it's not. It's just more. Uh, 
it's a PR exercise, it's here, it's about getting tourists. Again, it's it's not even about like engaging with the with the everyday, you know, the, the existing community. And I mean, I've been having this conversation with someone like, what will it take? And I think it becomes again, but you know, maybe a few people, let it be five people. Let's start, you know, do an event, do a discussion, let just five people come. Maybe the next time these five people will bring their five people, you know? So it's 2021 and it just feels like we're talking about something that probably was what, what was happening maybe with the artists like Hassan Sharif in the eighties, right? So they were doing their own thing and whoever wants to come, <laughs> come. Sure, but, sure. Um, you know, so in terms of like institutions, I used to think, yeah, they need to. But it, in the end, I realized actually, you know what? It turns out they don't need to. They, they're there. They, they've got another kind of objective of why they exist here and what what they need to deliver. And it's not necessarily, you know, developing critical thinking. I mean, like I said, some do. I'm not, you know, so I'm not saying every single one is, but um uh, and, and it doesn't have to be like I'm putting this exhibition because I want you to think, you know, that there are, you know, there are interesting ways of doing it, there are challenging ways, but that's it. It's just what kind of work is being shown, you know, is it challenging work? Because that's the other thing, right? So it's also about being safe again, back to worrying about offense, censorship, you know? So again, if nothing is extremely, you know, there's no new work, new name, it's, I mean, it, it, then it, things won't evolve. And fine, if it means once a year have something that feels a bit challenging, that'll be amazing. <laughs> uh, but I mean, who else has the responsibility? I mean, I always feel individuals need to feel responsible as well, but everyone's caught up with their life work. And, you know, I mean, the unfortunate thing here as well is there's a very imbalance when it comes to work and non-work times, you know, so people miss out on going to things, you know, people would like to go and, you know, listen to a live performance or watch an interesting movie screened in a small venue, but some, you know, a lot of people don't have time, but so I think, I think, again, it's lots of different factors and players that there's a responsibility. Where, where's education? Like how, how active are the schools engaging with their students to do things? I mean, one of the things that came to mind, um, like, you know, during diff, like Gulf News, and now it's a complete you know, shadow of whatever it was, like Gulf News is just, <laughs> the, the publication is just, um, yeah, I mean, the, that's a separate discussion. But during Dubai Film Festival, they would like bring in young, they would, they would, they had this thing called Young Journalist Award, where they would invite school children to come and watch movies, yeah, and then the, the best writing would then uh, be printed in, in their paper. And I thought that was a really lovely initiative. And I wish it was something that happened most of the year and not just wait, you know, December during DIFF to do that. And so, which makes me think, you know, do existing institutions, how can they engage with, yeah, like, so develop talent, hear younger voices and, you know, and, and have the courage to let them, you know, get and courage to um, let them engage with work and write about work or think about work or, or even, find different ways of doing it. Like, you know, maybe a traditional written piece isn't enough anymore. You know, how do you engage with younger people? You know, is there a way of doing it through TikTok? I don't know, like, you know, how, what's the language to speak to them to, to do it? But uh, it's just, um, but the current institutions, I think they're not gonna lead the way. I think if they see maybe individual examples or maybe small collectives doing something, then they might be interested and then go, okay. And then maybe they will call in, the individual or the collective to then do it in their name, right? But I, 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 I again, I used to have hope and expectation that in institutions will lead the way. I, I don't believe that anymore. Okay, okay, fair enough. Um, let's go now to film and cinema. And uh, recently you've been uh, creating film programs for different venues. Um, let me begin by asking you why is it important to offer the public films to watch? Uh, because I'm sure I'm not the only one who thinks the moving image as a medium, so whether it's a Hollywood film <laughs> or an experimental film by an artist, it's a way to lose yourself in a piece of work and it's a way to make sense of the world and, you know, 
feel like you can relate to something, feel challenged by something, see something you've never seen before, uh, feel something you've never felt before. That is a medium I that is very important to me. It's it's like this is from my you know as a child watching. I mean, I still remember watching Planet of the Apes as a child sitting on the sofa, you know, and that ending. And I was like, what, eight or nine, right? So it's like, what, what, what is this? Um, you know, movies on VHS. And then once we, you know, all the, you know, going to cinemas and, and someone had said recently, like, you know, moving image should be bigger than you, you know, like the whole point of this format and this medium is that it's, a, it's bigger than you, which is why I find it very frustrating how, you know, the pandemic has made it, you know, the whole everything's on streaming, which, you know, again, is another separate topic that we could analyze and discuss. But to me, that's what's important about movies. And it's not just, and yes, whatever we get, there's more, there's always more, there's always opportunities to show things. Even if they're old films, there's, they could be new for other people, you know, it's introducing new generations to older films they've never heard of. And, 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 and because I've been going to film festivals a lot, so you get exposed to so many things more than, you know, like, I mean, the Dubai Film Festival was like a, an amazing thing because we're suddenly now exposed to world cinema that you wouldn't have on, you know, the rest of the year and same with Abu Dhabi Film Festival. Uh, and even the Gulf Film Festival, like it had a strand of, you know, like it was regional film, but there was also international film. So there were these, this constant hunger of seeing what stories are being told using the medium of, you know, of, of cinema. And, and then I had this opportunity. I mean, it's again, like I think back, you know, it's not like, oh, I want, you know, I wish I was a film curator. I wish I studied it. It's just something that happened because I felt I was in a position where I feel I know enough to be able to put together certain programs. And it all started really with Louvre Abu Dhabi when they first opened. Um, so for the opening week, you know, they had a whole bunch of events and I was one of the artists who was asked to make work that was kind of played during the opening week. It was, you know, scheduled like for the evening. And then, um, whilst I was there they were showing me around and they said oh you know we also have an auditorium and to me like you know any new place that opens I think oh is there an auditorium because I immediately think oh there must be a big screen something will be used to show movies um and then when the a new venue does not include an auditorium I get very disappointed especially if it's a culture <laughs> uh, venue but yeah so they showed me the auditorium and I just straight away said I'm like oh my god are you gonna show film they're like yeah we're thinking about it and I said look if you ever want to like think about film programming I want to raise my hand I'd really love to be able to have an opportunity to do so and that was the first time you offered such an offer wow yeah I had done something very casual with the jam jar a few years ago uh, in the summer I called it cruel summer because <laughs> it's so okay. hot over here like it's a, and, I, and basically I just found a bunch of videos on Vimeo like and it was kind of very anti-summer <laughs> like it was very dark and depressing <laughs> but Hital from jam jar is amazing she's always been open to interesting ideas and you know it's a bunch of people sitting on bean bags and you know we just play these videos you know so I was maybe and I didn't necessarily think of it oh I'm film programmer or anything like that it was just hey look can I put together and I think because I was spending a lot of time looking at videos because stuff for the blog right so I would always spend a lot of time on Vimeo trying to find you know music videos or in short films and and I just kept seeing I'm like okay what if I put together a bunch and you know call it cool summer and you know and we started playing the song Banana Rama cool summer before it started <laughs> and you know and we played these clips and it was fun so that was something I had done you know like on, on the side but yeah with Louvre Abu Dhabi it felt a bit more professionalized because now there's like a proper venue there's a budget you talk about ideas and yeah it all started with just you know like getting movies inspired by artworks you know and that was you know they they liked the idea and you know we started with that and then eventually it became you know they have different exhibitions like three or four exhibitions so then how to kind of program screenings that's in dialogue with the the uh, exhibitions which you know I like I and and I and it's just a new way of thinking and looking at work so it could and, and I was very happy I was able to bring experimental film I showed classic film, I show contemporary film. And again, I tried to make it as varied as possible. I definitely looked at making sure, you know, you include Arab cinema whenever the opportunity came up. But I just thought there was something just because in my nature, just, yeah, I'm always interested. Yeah, you find and what films would work. Or I remember what films I saw, you know, at festivals, for example, and wait, this would be a great one to, to bring here. So that's kind of how that started. And, um, and despite, you know, it is a museum, so it needs to go through approvals and you have to make sure you screen something that's not gonna like, you know, freak people out. And I know all of that going in, you know, I'm not, I'm not gonna bring something super, 
radical or something that will, you know, cause offense because, uh, you know, there's nudity or this or that, you know, or whatever. So, so of course I know all that going in, but, but that's, there's enough, there's enough in the world when it comes to movies to have something that wouldn't be an issue, but yeah, but because it's a Louvre Abu Dhabi, you know, there was this kind of, so it was also interesting kind of seeing, you know, the, the, the workings of how, you know, when it comes to showing films. So like I had, you know, it was two years and then it kind of stopped because of the pandemic, but you know, I don't know, I haven't really been called back. So I'm not sure if it's going to pick up or not or pick up with someone else. I don't know. They've been working with someone else to show short films targeting children. So that's just something that's just recently started because, yeah, they weren't, you know, they weren't doing anything for a long time. So I have no idea. I hope there's an opportunity to bring, you know, show films there because I feel like it's like a museum is not just to go and look at work, you know, sculptures and paintings, you know, like I feel the museum's role is yes, to engage with people and show films and they were, and they're free. Like, so it's not even hard to get, you know, they, they weren't even being charged, you know? So again, we are one of the few places where we're very generous that way in terms of, you know, hosting events and it, uh, but yeah, just how to make sure people are aware of this and, you know, how to get to it and that you don't have to pay to go in, you know, you can actually go inside to go in for free fine you obviously can't walk around you know the museum uh, for free but you know you go straight to all the auditorium but i just feel it's a venue that needs to actively you know because the exhibitions are very long term like they could be there for six months you know so wait what what happens in between right so you know like and i feel cinema is one movie showing movies is one way of really having an an, an active and engaged program uh but yeah then and then shortly on the side i also had an opportunity to put a small small program uh charge a film platform like you know yusuf shaheen because that was a retrospective i had attended in paris and i'm like why aren't his movies you know like we're in our country why aren't we showing it right you know but again just a handful of titles because i just it wasn't possible to do everything uh i worked with the african institute i've um NYU Abu Dhabi once had an event linked to an exhibition. So I you know, put together a short film program and we had a discussion. And uh, um, and yeah, lately I've just been helping out with the venue called The Theater, where you know, I, I kind of started off saying, look, you know, no one shows documentaries. Why, you know, like this venue could, you know, at least it, it's different, right? Because no one else is showing documentaries. And I could document like nonfiction cinema is never, I, I feel it doesn't get appreciation the way it deserves because there's a world of rich nonfiction cinema out there, you know, like through time. And there's so many things I'd love, love, love to, to show. So yeah, we kind of showed if, you know, if you, and it doesn't help that, you know, you come up with a film program during a pandemic. So it's how to convince people to come, how to make sure they feel safe. But I feel it's important to still try. So even if it's 10 people that come, it's a statement again to, you know, stop especially here if we can't step out if we're not under curfew um that you know we everything is is this whole kind of being uh, chained to your computer screen and just being normal i thinking this is the only way to engage with work uh, works of art is 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 not ideal i feel it's numbing people <laughs> You know, so so if there's an opportunity, and like I said, not everywhere is like that. You know, we don't have curfew. You know, we're you know we're at least in Dubai. You know, people can't step out, and and of course it's understandable. You know, not everyone wants to go out. That's completely understandable as well. But I feel there's also a statement being made, like, look, you know, we can do things in per, you know there are in-person events, and and uh, you know and and it, it's worth if you are interested to to step out. Um, yeah, and I have a few other ideas in store that I'm hoping to lock down that, you know, post Ramadan, maybe to, to do a few other things. Because, yeah, I always have like a long list of themes and films I want to show. There's so many, but it's just, yeah, not enough time or not enough venues to convince them to say, look, because to me, there's so many venues. So it's not even about like building a new space. Like we already have lots of existing spaces. And, you know, why, why can't we use these spaces in a way to to show at least selfishly you know movies <laughs> absolutely absolutely um i want to talk about something um related uh but from the other side which is the audience uh, i've been noticing not not specifically about your work i'm talking now in general uh yani you and i attended a lot of film events a lot of film festivals we've seen a lot and a lot of uh, full houses uh, Anna, personally, I've seen films sitting on the floor uh, because how full the theater was in whatever event. And that happened so many times. Uh, but I 
notice the trend lately, uh, um, uh, doubting how big the audience uh, is for film in the UAE, specifically in the UAE. And, um, some, and the flip side is always blaming the public for low attendance whenever that happens. Uh, how do you view this issue? It's like, where is, where is the problem? Yeah, it's, I'm, look, um, I mean, I just think from the start, we never really, we don't have a big percentage of population who are interested in, in, in your, kind of your not typical cinema, right? So I, the, the, the film festivals are packed because it's an event. So now I've like naively at the time, like, look, all these people love movies and cinema, then that's why the festival, but it's because it's an event and it sounds sexy to say, you know, I watch movies at a festival because these same people surely don't turn up when there are like individual smaller programs happening at other venues, right? So I'm like, where, excuse me, you know, where, you know, and people like, you know, I love movies, I'm a cinephile, you know, even, even, again, the usual, you know, I'm a movie buff and the movie buff will only talk about the big Hollywood releases because, you know, they were invited to come to the premiere and that's the only time you see them talking about movies in public, right, on their social media. But no one's like promoting when there are other interesting events happen, right? So it, again, this place has trained people to think a big thing, you know, like uh, it has to be a big event followed by a party and a buffet you know, so so people will, will turn up for it, right? So whether it's uh, inviting media to come and pay attention so that they write about it, you have to feed them, you know, an elaborate buffet. Um, and same with events. So it's like, it's cool and sexy to say, oh, oh my God, you know, I took time and I watched four films uh, this week. It's like, okay, where, wh you know, you can't make time to watch one film that was screened this month, you know? So it's, it's so so this place has created this buzz where it becomes people are very happy to be associated with a, a buzzy you know event type thing. Um, so that's one level. And number two is again not enough promotion out there, right? So marketing, film marketing here is extremely poor. So with film festival because it already has a budget, right? So there's advertising, there's promotion, there's outdoors. You know, it's already part of the package. It's never about individual film, but suddenly it's, be, it's the film festival, right? So hey, I'll go to the film festival and watch. And obviously the films with the big name stars, you know, that has big attention in the media and the small, you know, smaller films or the new discoveries. It'll be a few people like even, well, you know, well, and was my film festival partner in time, you know, so we're the ones who'll be actively tweeting and, you know, go see this and, and, uh, and, and do that. And look, and it's not that different to festivals elsewhere, right? And some festivals in other cities, it's very engaged with this population where the population are, you know, totally into movies, old or new. And, and other places, it is a PR, it's about the sponsors and whatever. So I've seen this, you know, in other places here. But here, like I said, they've just trained people where it has to be a big event for some people to, to turn up. But then if you do an interesting program and Louvre Abu Dhabi, you're not going to get that same number of people turning up, right? Um, and what more can be done? Yeah, again, like back to kind of how much is the local media interested in promoting these events? If it's not a big sexy name, if it's not a known film title, if it's not award winning, no, you know, that it doesn't have that interest versus, again, you know, kind of look there's some cool independent thing happening you know and maybe maybe it needs to be packaged as you know it's underground you know even though like you know there's nothing underground these are all like in established venues and maybe you know that would get people's interest but i i never like playing that game like it's never about being you know oh it's underground and it's hard to get to because these are all like in established venues there's nothing uh, there's nothing subversive or <laughs> nothing you know uh, about these events but yeah like i question it i mean we we this comes up a lot like okay so if these same people were interested in doing the film festival because even like when diff did diff 365 so they took the initiative of trying to screen some of the film festivals and you know show them and and you know and then it becomes you know the cinemas aren't and the cinemas aren't promoting it you know so it's not even like kind of even actively pushed on their own website or on their own social media right so that's like another discussion where cinemas are just happy to promote the big you know the marvel the superhero and a million social media updates about that movie and hardly any update about, about you know the the one kind of small film that would be lovely and everyone will love but you know if they know about it um 
And so, I mean, there've been so many initiatives and that's why maybe these things come and go, you know? So remember like when the picture house at Dubai Mall opened and you know, that was the art house cinema and we're gonna show films and that came and went. And then I know uh, like uh, Alliance Francaise or Institut Francaise took an actual cinema, uh, one room in uh, Ibn Battuta, like so Cinema 13. And that was refreshing again in well, and I would be like the nerds turning up and watching it, you know? But like, it's not a packed room. But then if it's the European Film Festival week, suddenly everyone there right so you have to you put the word festival and suddenly they turn up and just so that you know you can't I can't just suddenly tomorrow say I'm hosting a film fest architecture film festival you have to pay to use the word festival right so if you're going to sell tickets and whatever like so the system here you know if you're doing a festival like suddenly the authorities here will go wait if it's a festival it needs you know it needs to be right. yeah like you know you like so yeah I can't just suddenly say tomorrow I'm doing a experimental film festival i can't use that word festival right? right so this is it so it this place has somehow programmed people i mean it's the same with art right so art week so people say oh i miss art and then art week everyone's there but like wait the art is being shown all year like <laughs> you know the art wasn't being hidden because uh, even now because there's art dubai so somehow like oh finally finally it's so great that art you know art week i mean the galleries were open all year and the art is there like they, you know and and same with movies i think because of the big movie like when tenet opened right oh my god i'm so happy i'm finding the cinema and that was in august i'm like the cinema is open like two months before <laughs> You know, it's like, I'm, so it, it's this thing, like everything has to have this big buzz around it. And this place has just reinforced it more and more. That kind of, um, it has to be a big event for people to think it's of value to go. Because if it doesn't have that kind of uh, hype, people dismiss it. People think it's not of quality, it's not good enough. I don't know if that answers your question. I'm just, I'm using this opportunity to just vent basically. <laughs> Well, personally, I believe if uh, I, I, mean, I would stress more on the promotion and uh, marketing yeah. side, um, but let's hope, let's hope things uh, work better soon, um, because I believe the audience are there, the films are there, uh, it just takes a little bit of planning and then people will come. Yeah, yeah, uh, no, that, the audience is definitely there. Like, and like I said, fine, it's not in the hundreds and it's not the, it's not the same number that will come and watch, you know, like Godzilla yeah. versus yeah. Kong, like, yeah, the cinema yeah. apparently, because I went to see Nomadland, you know, and also Wednesday, 11 o'clock is, when, you know, the first screenings of these films. And there was a long queue for Godzilla and Kong, right? <laughs> like they were all there, families, singles, and, and Nomadland, like I was the only one that turned up for it. But uh, that was on that day. So we're not going to get those numbers. I know that. But there are, there is, again, I think it's stop having to judge a quality of an event based on number of people that turn up. You know, like, I think that's the other shift. I, I'm hoping this pandemic will maybe educate venues. That's not, it's about quality and not just quantity. And, and yeah, and I think this constant uh, uh, responsibility of, yeah, constant promotion, finding ways, you know, emailing your database actively, pushing it on your social media account, you know, maybe invite a bunch of journalists, have a conversation a round table to then convince them to, write about it, I, you know what I mean? There, there are ways, it, it just means extra work. And that's the extra work I think, um, you know, bit by bit people need to be pushed into. Yeah, I agree. Uh, well, maybe it's time for uh, more of uh, underground events and uh, small groups, like you suggested, I think that would um, yeah. have a, a positive effect uh, on the long run. Uh, anyway, uh, Hen, thank you so much for this amazing uh, dialogue and conversation. Thanks for um, wanting to have it with me. <laughs> no, no, like uh, always, always, always a pleasure. Um, we can open the floor now for a Q&A if anybody has any thoughts or question. Yes, you um, have many questions, Noah, in the chat box. Uh, oh. Yes, so we have questions from Sonali Azza Abdullah. Please go ahead. So Sonali, would you like me to, would you like to ask a question? I'll give you the mic. Hi, sure. Hi, um, Sonali. Hello. Um, I, I guess the questions, I mean, there's lots of questions about what do we do about this question of critique, right? Like mm. how does it get translated in every sense of the term into something that sounds more positive? than negative. So, I mean, mm. you can see in the chat box, I, I can't read quite quickly enough. Everyone's great questions about that. But my own was a very simple question about terminology. Mm. Um, you have some thoughts about that. 
Yeah, I mean, I'm looking because you put the word tahlil, adrasa, you know, so like studying, uh, analyzing. Yeah, I'm, I don't know. Like, it's just, um, yeah, because there's also review. So you do you say review in a way to critique something? You know, that, you know, that could be a way, right? But then some people just a review is just a description of what they saw and it doesn't go beyond that, right? So, so yeah, I don't know. And, I, and what, what's review in Arabic? I should know, but I don't. I'm, I'm not sure. Uh -huh. Sorry? Uh -huh. Okay. So yeah, I, I I don't know if that's uh, a, a way of yeah. How how do you say? Because the review, like I said, a lot of people, at least a lot of writers, also it just becomes a description. It's not a. It doesn't go go beyond that, you know. And and I think, and if you do anything beyond that, they think it's uh, you're being pretentious or it's too academic. It's not speaking to the everyday, you know. So I, again, it just becomes like. Fine, even if you are doing kind of deeper thinking about a work, how do you do it where it also feels accessible? It doesn't suddenly feel like, oh, it's something that fits in an academic journal. Uh, I think it's a constant having to think about this. Like, yeah, there's no one immediate answer I can think of Sonali, but I think it just become, like, I mean, lately I, I would say, oh, I'm, you know, a few thoughts on uh, X, Y, Z, you know, so I would just put it out like that, <laughs> you know, like here are a few thoughts and, you know, just to see how people, I you know I wouldn't say like, oh, I've just reviewed this or whatever. And same with film, like, you know, film notes, you know, I watch this and here's some film notes, you know, and, and then it just becomes a way of putting, putting it out there, you know, so. So yeah, I think it's just an ongoing thing, but um, yeah, I don't, I don't have like a one in, you know, final answer for this, but it is about, I think, terminology and how you put it and context and how, how you present it. All right, second question is from Azza. She asked me to read it instead of giving her the mic. So the question and it, well, she has three questions, but I'm gonna start with the first one since it relates to critique. Uh, the question is, do you think there's a connection between the general fear of critique and the media's focus on surface level reporting of cultural events and output? Oh, definitely there's fear. Like there's no doubt, <laughs> like fear is, is the thing because it's, um, because it's not clear what's okay and what, I mean, fine, we know what's okay and not okay to say, but also it's very great. There's no clear manifesto on you cannot say this, you cannot say that. Like, and I think that's also on purpose. So people are always meant to feel you're not sure if you say <laughs> or don't say. Um, fear is it, I mean, like even just simple examples of like even food reviews, right? So like when food uh, critics will say some, the, this restaurant did about, you know, they it becomes, uh, you, you know, like you've uh, tarnished our reputation. I mean, it's even in our laws now, right? It's, it's in the laws in the UAE that you can't say something negatively, you know, tarnishing someone's reputation. And that could be uh, an institution, a restaurant, uh, a, a nightclub or a person so that the, so fear is definitely part of it because no one wants to you know in case because all it takes is one person to complain and say you've caused distress and you've you know damaged my reputation for it to be a court case that's all it takes for it to become a serious issue right so then someone is fined or someone is jailed or, or whatever so fear is definitely part of it so then how do you combat that by still talking about something that feels analytical without fear yeah it's down to individual personal courage i guess and how much you're willing to 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 push it out there you know i sometimes say you know i don't know like humor could he being doing it as humor is that a way but again even you know comedy might be be an issue um sometimes all it takes is even you know putting something next to something you know and like okay this this you know this is like, I mean, again, well, and I've done this before, you know, when we think something is a copy of something, we just, we just you know, put the two side by side there, you know, like that's our statement. That's our way of critiquing, look, it, it's out there. So it, uh, fear is, is definitely a factor. So that's, uh, it's unfortunate. And because we don't have independent publications, um, so everything is very much tied in with the government. So that's it. So which means, yeah, will it ever improve? maybe extremely small steps for improvement, but it won't be incredibly radical. And I mean, I'm seeing like self-censorship and just censorship elsewhere as well. Like, I mean, it's not just here now, I'm just, the way I see certain things being censored in other parts of the world, it's like, oh my God, this is just like the similar scenarios we would be having here, right? So, I mean, the New York Times is guilty of it, BBC, you know, it's, so it's not, it's not a, I mean, we're used to it because that's kind of always been the case, but it's just becoming more and more 
everywhere around the world, like who is controlling the narrative yeah. from all levels, from politics, from social, from culture. And, and since you mentioned comedy as you know, part of critiquing as well, I, uh, I would like to explore the idea, and I had that also a question from my end, like the difference, is there a difference between direct and indirect critiquing? Are people more willing to have an indirect critique? For example, probably they're willing to have a, an art piece that would critique a certain social norm, but not somebody writing directly about it. Or even Possibly. having kind of a comedian kind of, you know, making fun of certain social norm of a certain politician, which would be in a way okay without mentioning the name, mm -hmm. then actually voicing it straight up. So do you think that's yeah. a normal? Yeah, yeah that, that, that's possibly a way, right? And then, yeah, so how, so that work is a reaction or a commentary about something. And then, yeah, then, but then, you know, then we start moving into, you know, allegory and, and you know, and, and not being direct. And again, it just creates this constant not being honest and, and direct about it. And, and they say it's in our culture and it's our nature. And, you know, we never say something up front, you know, but, uh, but yeah, I don't know. I mean, like, and to me, like the world of culture, like it's not, we're not saving lives. It's not open heart surgery. <laughs> we're not sending anyone to the moon, you know, like these should be, they can't, you know, and the whole point of culture is engaging with, with life, you know, how you respond to things. And that should be part of a way to have that dialogue. It's not all about always finding some, a fault and saying something negative. It's never, it, it, that's not what it is all the time. I mean, obviously there are occasions where it is, but, but that's not the default, uh, that should not be the default thinking or way of thinking about, you know, how to have these dialogues, right? Because, I mean, obviously there are serious issues and yes, artists address this through their work. How are they expressing serious issues? And, you know, there are obviously, you know, almost like life-threatening issues, you know, and, you know, and the artists are there to deal with it. So whether it's poetry or story writing or artwork, whatever, of course, these pieces of work exist. And they're there because it's a commentary and it's a critique of these situations. So yeah, then how do you have that that dialogue, you know, and and how do you relate relate it to your, you know, the present, right? So that's also part of the discussion. Yeah. Uh, the the question of fear goes back to a third question that Azza had asked: Is that has social media kind of played a role in in magnifying this fear, so people tend to shy away from critiquing or receiving critique in, in that case? Uh, yeah, because, I mean, I just feel like social media has fragmented and watered down things and attention span is minimal, <laughs> you know, like what's the, you know, and, and people do it because they want to go viral and people do it because they want likes and so, it, so that, so what's being put out there is really not about, uh, you know, saying something of value or see, I mean, I like notice when, I mean, even with my brother who's around, like when we post something where we're joking, but we're really, you know, making fun of something very specific, like that gets attention. So again, when it's negative, you know, suddenly it's being shared, it's being liked, or it's being, people react to it, right? And send messages and, oh my God. And then when you just post something, you know, like fun or, hey, this is happening, it's it's not the same numbers. <laughs> so uh, social media is there to just, I feel it's very distracting. It's just people are now in auto mode. It's what, what looks pretty, I wanna show off. I wanna post a picture of myself. I went to this event. Um, if it's gonna be anything serious, there's fear because like I said, it could be reported, right? So, and, and again, I mean, I can't speak for other countries but here there, it is a serious issue. If you say something that is, like I said, it could be whether it's personal offense or you're offending the country or you're offending, it is a serious issue. So that's why, you you know, so even on social media, you don't have that, right? And I mean, Twitter was like a really active space to do that, but even then, you know, and because already a law is put in place, you know, so no questions asked, you know, if you say something that will feel that it's damaging to the country or to the person, there are consequences. So it's, it's as simple as that. You know? Thank you. These are all the questions in the box. So now if, if you have anything further to ask. Um, no, that's it. If uh, no one else has any um, thought or question that they want to share, uh, we can wrap up. Yeah, we've crossed eight o'clock. It's oh, oh, we, we have one. We have one. Why I have a question. It, it's not a question. It's more of a continuation of what you were saying, just because apart from uh, the official or legal uh, situations we might have, uh, you and me and a lot of other people have suffered being kind of shunned so we wouldn't <laughs> voice. Uh, 
uh, a, a concern or a comment that is not, this was awesome, brilliant, thank you very much. <laughs> so can you just elaborate of, of how this, this kind of self criticism, self, um, uh, not criticism, self banning, self self censorship? Yes, that self censorship would end up because you wouldn't be invited to, to sit with them. You'd have to cut yourself out and then it all ends up being fluffy. Yeah. And, and yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's definitely happened where, you know, suddenly, you know, they don't even want to say hello to you in public. Like, and that's fine. It's, I mean, I was never interested in their parties or their dinners anyway. <laughs> so, so it's like, you know, keep it keep it I you know so that's not a problem but there is and yeah and then does it become do I say something and you know you pick and choose right and is, is it even at, and at this stage like one's growing older not growing younger so it's like you know will it even make a difference and you know how willing are people uh, so yeah sometimes yeah you just save it and I mean lately I've also felt by not saying something that's out there that's getting attention is a statement in itself like you're already you know and especially if maybe they expect someone like me to say it, or, you know, I went to the event and I'll post pictures and I don't. <laughs> so I think there is this, there is this deliberate tactic of, you know what, by not acknowledging it as is also a form of critique. You know, it's quiet and subtle, but, but it's there. So that's something I've been, you know, I've picked up uh, maybe the past year or so. <laughs> But yeah, I mean, there is that because there is, and we've seen it with others, like, you know, when someone will, and, I, and they will tell me, you know, I wrote something and it upset someone and that, and, and I'm like, you know, but then that's your job. It, and I think here, what the issue here, uh, lack of professionalism is an issue, right? So journalists are expected to be friends, but no, then how are you going to write without kind of feeling like you're compromising this relationship or because you know you want to make sure you're invited to the next uh, dinner for the next opening right because it's always about like being uh, invited to the dinner <laughs> so it, it be, yeah yeah you know so uh, so there is al already that in play and I always I mean even as a, not that I'm saying you know I'm like oh an established uh, publication but I always say if I'm going to write about something I also don't want to be seen like I'm super buddies with these uh, places or these filmmakers or whatever right because then it feels like yeah you're there's favorism or of course you're going to write great things about it because you're friends so um, so because there is also that very blurred line and when you raise it people kind of get offended that you <laughs> raise it and and like what I said yeah there is um, that but yeah so it's not necessarily self-censorship, but it's almost like deliberate tactics of also not saying anything, you know, where, yeah, like you're, that actually it doesn't matter that I don't even want to talk about it. <laughs> um, okay, anyone else before we wrap? Anyone else? All right. Okay, well, well, thank you everyone for joining us this evening. It was really uh, uh, amazing to have you. Thank you, Hen, so much. No, thank you. Uh, Thanks for having me. Like, it's nice because we've talked about some of this off, you know, on the phone or on WhatsApp. And yeah, yeah. it was nice to kind of have this discussion. And it just felt like, yeah, you know, even though we're not like in a room together, but it was nice. With a nice crowd. crowd. With a nice lovely crowd. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right. And thank you. Silver Line, I thank you both also for this lovely conversation. I think we can't just have enough. We need to have more of those. But, but, and so thank you for that. And thanks for everyone for attending too. Thank sure. you. Thanks Thank a lot. You. Thanks all for joining. Good Thanks. night. Bye -bye. Bye -bye. Have a nice evening. Bye.